show of hands, how many of you own a mobile phone? OK, everyone. That was pretty easy. Here's another question, and it's a bit harder, so answer honestly. How many of you can last an entire day without your mobile phones or laptops? I see one or two hands, but not many. And that's understandable. Whether it is to communicate with our friends and families, looking up that weird zit that right, appears right before your TEDx talk, using chat GPT for assignments, looking for job and internship opportunities, or even if it is to just check time. Technology has become deeply intertwined with almost every aspect of our lives. Today, technology is one of the most fundamental pillars of our society. And this means it is instrumental in determining a person's social and economic prospects, be it in terms of finding jobs, housing, or even accessing medical care. The relationship we share with technology is a two-way street, where on one hand, it is instrumental in defining the human life, but on the other hand, humans are the ones defining and creating technology. But the question is, who currently defines it? And who should be defining it? Let me take you on a journey as we try and answer this question. Imagine you're standing in front of massive gates, beyond which lies an entirely new society that you're about to enter. Now, before you enter, I tell you that you have the opportunity to come together and create its rules and design its social systems from scratch. But here's the catch. You have no idea who you will be in that society. You could be born into a family that's rich and powerful, or into one that's poor and struggling. You could be male, female, non-binary. You have no idea about any other details, including your class, caste, religion, gender, or your sexual orientation. Take a moment to think about that. What kind of rules would you want to create in this situation? Would you want it to be as fair as possible to give you the best shot at having a good life? This is a thought experiment by the political philosopher John Rawls called the original position where he places participants behind a veil of ignorance. Rawls argues that any society built on this principle will provide each person with the ability to as much freedom as possible and provide the maximum possible resources to those least advantaged. It is thought that when you create a society with the most vulnerable in mind, you make a better world for everyone else to live in. Now, the digital society that we are currently in has a disproportionate imbalance in who benefits, who doesn't, and in who decides who benefits and who doesn't. Globally, majority of the decision-making power is concentrated in the global north, so even though tools like mobile phones are becoming cheaper and more widely accessible across the world, power and control over what can be installed in it and the data that is collected from there still primarily sits in the hands of tech firms based in the US and is at best governed by norms set in EU or US. Now, in the recent years, there has admittedly been grow a, a growing importance on diversity and inclusion. Tech industry in particular has come under scrutiny for its lack of diversity, and they have taken steps, such as setting councils focused on inclusion, setting diversity goals, and even having training programs. However, most of these existing efforts tend to examine a single marker of oppression, that is either just gender or just race. And that is not enough. I realized this through my childhood friendship with Aifa. Let me tell you about her. So I grew up in India in an army family, which meant I moved to a new place every two years. Some were remote villages that nobody had ever heard of, while others were major metropolitan cities. In one of these places, I made a best friend, as we do in school, Aifa. Aifa was just smarter, cooler, funnier, prettier than I ever was, and I had no idea why she decided to be my friend. Aifa was also from a lower-class Muslim family. Now, I moved to another place, but we kept in touch. 
And through occasional phone calls, I would hear about her difficulty in continuing education because of lack of financial resources. And even in getting internships and visas because of her Muslim name. Today, I is killing it in life. She's currently doing a PhD from a well-known university. But the journey that she had to take to get there is not only different from her peers who are from different nationalities, but also from mine. So although Aifa and I are both women who grew up in India, our challenges and experiences are vastly different. This friendship was instrumental in my understanding of what I now know is the theory of intersectionality. First coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, the theory of intersectionality refers to ways in which different aspects of a person's identity can expose them to overlapping forms of discrimination and marginalization. So in my identity, I am a young woman from a middle-class family in India, and I speak with a non-Western accent. The way I interact with the world is dictated by all these complex markers coming together. If we consider the digital society to be an image of the physical world, it will have inherited, along with other aspects, historical patterns of inequality that are dictated by our different identities. So when we think of technology, it is important to look at our complex markers coming together, because if we don't, we risk exacerbating these inequalities. For example, there are several studies showcasing the discriminatory rates of error in speech recognition technology. In 2020, a group of researchers from Stanford University tested five speech recognition systems and found that all of them had a higher rate of error for African-American participants than for white Americans. There are many studies over the years that have shown us, similarly, a higher rate of error for women and people with non-standard accents. The implications of this range from my parents being a bit frustrated about having to ask Siri to play their Bollywood song twice and instead getting a response that says, sorry, you didn't catch that, try again, but to also much more severe consequences such as speech recognition systems that can be used by people with disabilities, such as those with motor impairments, to write texts and emails, being inaccessible to some only because they're from a particular gender or speak with a particular accent. Another example is the bias in facial recognition algorithms. In 2018, a project called the Gender Shade Studies by Joy Blumvini analyzed facial recognition algorithms through an intersectional lens and found that all three of the algorithms analyzed performed worse on darker-skinned women than on lighter-skinned men. The error rates were up to a 34%. This, again, has very severe implications, such as being incorrectly tagged to a mugshot just because you're a woman with a darker skin tone. Speech and facial recognition technology is getting better, and the discriminatory rates are reducing. However, we were creating these supposedly disruptive technologies that were based on algorithms still trained on data collected from an unequal status quo. As I speak to you today, the generative AI's arms race, kicked off by ChatGPT, has individuals and private sector firm in a frenzy. However, it is important we pause and deliberate, because if we don't, and if we make the same mistakes that we have made in the past, the consequences this time would be much more severe. With every new technological advancement, as with any development, it is important to look at how historical patterns of exclusion have contributed to unequal access. A few years back, I had the opportunity to do field village um, in a small field work in a small village in the southern part of India. This village is part of a broader district that is home to several tribal communities of India, also called Adivasis or scheduled tribes. As a part of my research, I had the opportunity to interact with dozens of members from various communities, and I learned about their folklore, what they valued, and how they interacted with the world. I realized that unlike the mainstream notion, most Adivasi households used the technology available at their disposal as effective, effectively as possible. 
this meant using radios and satellite television to access information. Indigenous communities have shown us time and time again that when they have technology available to them as tools of empowerment, they use it by combining their traditional knowledge to solve global challenges such as on agriculture and also climate change. However, through my research, I also learned about the lived hardships that they have to face on a daily basis, such as the low quality of education in schools and the difficulty in accessing higher education due to lack of financial resources and language barrier. And even if somehow someone was able to pass all these hurdles, they still faced social discrimination based on class and caste at every other stage. Despite affirmative action laid down in the Indian constitution, which reserves places for members from Adivasi communities in universities, they make up for less than 5% in STEM undergraduate programs. The number only progressively gets worse at a master's and a PhD level. What this means is that it makes it that much harder to enter the room, let alone sit at a decision-making table. Adopting an intersectional approach to tech is not only the morally right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do because of the number of people it affects. The Adivasi community population in India alone stands at 104.2 million, which is about the population of France and Poland combined. So with advancement of technology, the role it plays in enabling or further isolating these communities is only going to increase. And it's important we get this right because we now have the opportunity to create rules for a digital society in ways we never necessarily had for the physical world. But how do we get this right? So at the World Economic Forum, I work with business, government, and civil society leaders from across the world to try and answer a variation of this question. And based on that, here are my three Cs. Center, collaborate, contextualize. First, we must move complex identities from the margins to the center of the design, development, and deployment process. This means not just looking at technical capabilities, but having a holistic picture of the social, economic, and political implications. Give space to people who have varied lived experiences, who come from countries with different laws and cultures, and who speak with a different accent than yours. Second, we must collaborate with communities to co-create technological innovations. While this can offshoot innovation in law resource environments in unexpected ways, it can also be a source of inspiration for new ideas. For instance, Adivasi communities in northern part of India are now using geospatial technology to reclaim forest rights. Third, we need to contextualize technological progress. And this means challenging the underlying assumption that something that's good for us is good for all. We must instead zoom into the specificity of the user and see what works for them. This potentially means adapting differently for different contexts and communities. Look, we have already entered the society. The gates have opened and there is no longer a veil of ignorance. But we still have the opportunity to create its rules. All of our different complex identities of class, caste, gender, race, sexual orientation, disability deserve to be prioritized. Because when we create a society with the most vulnerable in mind, we create a better world for everyone else to live in. Thank you.